Welcome to the Canadian Homeschooler Podcast, where we have real conversations about all things homeschooling from a Canadian perspective. I'm your host, Lisa Marie, and I'm joined by my co-host, Elena. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about adding nature studies to your homeschool through spring. So grab your favorite drink and come join us on the couch. So now that we finally hit spring in almost all of Canada, probably at this point of year, I thought we would have a conversation about spring and how to combine it with learning in your homeschool. So my first question for you is what's your favorite thing about spring? I would say my first or my favorite thing about spring would be the birds all coming back. Um, I mean, the ones that didn't stay the winter. Yeah, probably also all just watching the trees start leafing out and it's warmer out. So it's easier to do some school outside. Not that you can't be outside and we, we do go outside all year, but it's just that much easier. Um, and all the flowers starting to bloom, all those spring flowers that like you don't see other times of year as well. Yeah, for us, I think it's more just it feels fresh, like suddenly everything's kind of new and hopeful after maybe the doldrums of winter have kind of dragged it down for a bit. Sometimes it can be nice to have that refreshing back into life kind of idea. Maybe it's also got to do with it being able to get more outside and see more of nature than the whole gray, brown and white that you see all winter long I like color coming back it's much easier not to especially if you have like little kids not to be like okay here's the snowsuit here's okay I need help with the zipper and oh the boot doesn't feel right oh you got that on the wrong foot and it's bothering Mm -hmm. you like you know it's just easier overall all right so as homeschoolers when we're talking about learning activities for spring in particular do you think that there's like an added benefit or a a reason that we should focus on the seasons while we are homeschooling like is there a bonus or is it just like a a happy extra that we can add into our homeschool lives I think it's important to learn about nature and I mean nature in Canada involves seasons and it involves different I mean I all places have seasons but I meant like we have four very distinct seasons and yeah, so I think it, it helps to kind of talk about that. It helps with science topics, um, life cycles, um, learning about different temperatures, learning about different weather, all those kinds of things kind of tie in, um, even like migration, hibernation, all those kind of topics tie into the season. So I think I wouldn't say it's necessary, but useful. I mean, and all kids do need to at least learn about the seasons to a certain degree. Yeah, I think it's also helpful because it kind of naturally becomes part of the day, no matter, yeah. like as, as we're living life, we see the plants change and we see the growth of baby animals or baby birds, or in the summer, we see different things and observe different things just by being alive, right? So it's yeah. all it kind of naturally happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like it's just part of life. Like, I don't know, like if you go out on a walk and you're like, oh, wow, look at that, that tree's in bloom or or you see some, you know, your first robin of the spring, or you, you know, see some some ducks that had migrated away. And then, I don't know, kids just naturally have questions. And I use this as opportunities, like, hey, what kind of duck do you think that is? And let's look it up in our field guide. And, you know, it just, it, I would say it just happens kind of naturally. We don't really, like, specifically plan for it. Well, I think spring naturally leads us into a conversation about gardening and about flowers and plants and that kind of stuff. It's a great time to talk about how plants grow and for kids to observe that. Do you guys do a garden? Our house, we are very excited to plant seeds. We're very excited to watch the seedlings grow and to you know plant them in the garden. We're terrible at remembering to water them once they're outside. <laughs> and nobody and nobody likes to eat any of the vegetables when we finish picking them at the end of the season anyway so it feels a little bit moot point but they love seeing how plants grow so we do almost always try to plant something for the springtime what about you guys do you guys guys garden yeah so I've been gardening like I grew up doing some gardening when I was younger and then once I had kids I was like I want this to be part of our life so the very first spring that we had some ground with my oldest child um she was a toddler um we started doing gardening um i got into square foot gardening and so we had a couple of raised beds done the square foot gardening method and then we've moved a few times and each time we've set up uh, that system so we have that going i think i have trying to think i think i have six or seven beds now that are just for square foot gardening so growing like food um, and at one point, each of the kids had their own. Now, some of the kids have grown older, and 
at this point lost interest. And so I've taken them over. Um, I think it's only one of my daughters and my son who still have their own. Um, and with that, I mean that they're responsible for helping me plant it and helping me weed it. And um, they can pick whatever they want, whenever they want to eat out of that. And then they're responsible for watering it when it needs it. Um, they might sometimes ask me, does it need watering? But yeah, I really enjoyed it. However, I would say some years it gets more attention than others. So there's been seasons of our life where we've gone all for it and had a really su successful year. And then other times where it's like, wow, that turned into a jungle. But I think it's mm -hmm. still um, still very useful, still very important. The kids have always really loved it. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to learn to accept that if I want to have a garden at this stage of my life, some years are going to go better than others, and some years it's going to get more attention than others. And our As homeschoolers, how can we a big huge what garden? Kind of thing we should we do above ground for planters encouraging that my kids to be excited about it, like a plastic barrel with a wooden I, frame? We drilled holes and created like a French drain system kind of underneath with all the gravel and different stones oh, and cool. things. Uh, it works okay. I don't think it's the best necessary because we get a lot of wind, unfortunately. So it when oh, you finally okay. get the plants tall, it just comes whooshing across. But my kids still love it. And we do the square gardening, square gardening method too because it does work even when you have a small space like we only have I can literally put three by two in a planter so we've got like six squares or something per planter so we have to think about what exactly we're going to put in those squares and we rotate them every year like okay last year this was a tomato square so this year it's got to be a different whatever just to try and yeah preserve preserve the soil nutrition but so we don't have a huge garden I would love to have a huge garden we did one year when we lived a different place and that was a lot of fun but for us, it's just a small garden. So we do, I remember last year, maybe it was two years ago now, I don't know, all times blurring together. But we had at one point, we created a, we planted a whole bunch of seeds. And then we watched them grow. We created our own greenhouse. We made them out of, you know, piping with some wood and, and with a shelf. And then we put some lights in and we wrapped it in like plastic wrap, like a plastic table cloth that was see-through so that we could get some That's sunlight cool. we shoved it up against the window and then it reminded us to water them every day for a while they grew really well maybe a little too well and then we had lots to give out to our neighbors because we had more plants than we could put in our own little small garden but the kids really like getting their hands dirty and getting the opportunity to scoop dirt and plant seeds and then watch them grow it's so awesome to see their eyes light up just to see life coming out of the ground uh, there's so many things that you can do with gardening that you can unintentionally tie into homeschooling or education in some ways. There's so many things they learn, learning about compost, learning about um, what makes soil a good soil for the plants or not, learning about what plants need, learning about you know photosynthesis, learning about where food comes from, learning about pollination. Um, there's so many lessons that can come from gardening. But yeah, I don't think it needs to be a big garden. In fact, if somebody's just starting out, I would highly recommend don't go all out. Start mm -hmm. out small. Um, start out with some of the easier crops. Um, don't don't just go all out at first. Kind of take it slow. The other thing that gardening can do is kind of help with the conversations around nutrition too, because we talk yes. about what different kinds of fruits and vegetables have different amounts of nutrition in them, or different minerals or vitamins or whatever they have. So we often end up talking about why we would include tomatoes or why we would include carrots. I mean, along with the what people might eat in the house. Um, do you have any resources that you recommend for people who are thinking about starting a garden, whether that's for kids or whether that's for just them, their families? I know that the only thing that I really followed was the square foot gardening book. I've had gardening books here and there. A lot of the time, my main go-to resource is other gardeners. So I know there's like a local horticultural group here. The library is really into uh, gardening stuff. They often hold like workshops, just talking to other people who have gardens I'll see other neighbors gardening, talking to them. I find especially like older people, they often have like the time and the knowledge and the years of experience willing to share. So that's probably the re resources that I've used. But So in where we live in our local community, the library actually has a seed bank. And so people from the community will bring in seeds that they've grown from their plants and then people can exchange seeds. So keep an eye open for that kind of thing in your local community. I've seen other places where people will have started sprouts themselves and then you take them all to a, a an exchange place and you can everybody exchange their little sprouts so that you can get a different 
vegetable than what you were growing. Um, something else I've seen is in our community too, there are young kids who are trying to raise money for whatever they're trying to raise money for. So they will sell off seedlings that they've grown throughout the winter so that they're all ready to be planted. You don't have to do the seeds if you don't have the time energy or you've got cats like mine that like to eat all the seeds before they, the seedlings before <laughs> they can sprout. So if you are dealing with that, take a look around and see if there's anybody can do that too. It's not a bad idea to buy if your kids, if your seed adventures don't quite turn out the way that you had anticipated them to for whatever reason, buying them as slightly bigger and more hardy sprouts can be a good thing. Like they can be little like you know, mini tomato trees all ready to go. I, my best year ever was the year I bought tomato plants that were pre like pre-grown a little bit. So it just depends on where you live and what you're willing to do. But even if you're able to just do it in a little pot somewhere, it can be a lot of fun just to see how it, comes from a seed. Another idea that I had about the whole garden experience is understanding how seeds work. If you're able to get like a bean seed and pop it in half, you can see where the little baby sprout is inside and learn all about all the inside of the, the seed being its food and how it eats itself basically as it's growing up. It's like inside, you can learn all the parts of the seed and all that kind of stuff. If you yeah. soak it first, it's easier to open up. And kids love that. They're totally fascinated by the idea of a seed when it's still a baby seed. Yeah. <laughs> so, and learning and then being able to see how different seeds are between different plants. So like a tomato seed is completely different than a cucumber seed, which is completely different than a carrot seed. And they're fascinated by the fact that they're so different. I mean, I probably wouldn't be dumping out all different kinds of seeds and mixing them all together and then playing sort the seeds. But if that's your jam, cool, <laughs> good on you. But uh, kids are very curious about seeds and it's a lot of fun to discuss. I also like going to the store where they sell the little packets of seeds and just walking around it and asking the kids what catches their eye. Because sometimes they think of something completely that you would never have thought of trying to plant in a garden because they're just curious about what it would be like. So they're like, look at that, you know, purple carrot. Yeah. <laughs> or something we've different. Like, that. Yeah. Yeah. The purple carrots, we've grown purple peas. Um, we've grown like the multicolored carrots just, just for fun. Yeah. The coolest thing about carrots is you can't tell until you pull them out. So they're always like, is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? I'm like, I don't know. Let's wait a little longer until the leaves are really big. And then they pull them out and they're fascinated by the different sizes that they turn out and how big they can actually get. I mean, yeah. ours have never been fantastically large, but our neighbors are very successful at it. So we compared ours with theirs and we talked about whether our above ground garden, like our above ground garden planter and the effects of that versus a garden that's in the ground. So we've had some good conversations about that too. Yeah, another thing that um, we've done, and especially like maybe you don't have like any space to do a garden at all, there can still be ways to do indoor growing. So things like, for example, we've done where you take like a jar or you can take like a Ziploc bag and put a damp paper towel in it and put the bean seed in there. And you can even do a few and like we did like different conditions. So we did one where we put it and taped it to a cold window and another one where we taped it to a wall that wasn't, you know, a cold spot. One where we put it in a drawer and then like check on them. And you can see like the one in the drawer still grew, but the leaves were like all yellowed. And like, why would that be? The one on the window barely grew at all. Um, I think one, one time we did that with one kid, it didn't even grow because it's so cold, um, you know, and so just different conditions and you can watch the bean plant grow. Um, you can watch the, the roots and that's not something you mm -hmm. see under the dirt. It's just an easy way to do like you can buy those expensive root viewers, but like why? Like you can just do it with materials you have. The other thing I've seen is if you still have a CD collection at home, you can use the see-through CD case. Oh, and just that's plant, cool. it, plant it in there and then you can watch the whole thing right against the side of the CD case. So Oh, that's a neat idea. I don't know that we have any of those left, but I've seen them though. You could probably grab them cheap at a thrift store too. So yeah, that's yeah. True. Yeah. Uh, we did it in a jar too. I find like you almost have to make like a little pocket with the paper towel to keep it, but then it keeps it upright more. And uh, I don't know. I kind of liked that. Um, another thing to do is like sprouting seeds. So ones that you can actually eat, you can actually buy seeds that are meant for sprouting. Um, just be careful that you're actually buying sprouting seeds because I believe some seeds can be treated. So you wouldn't want to be eating those. So if you buy the sprouting seeds and sprout them, um, it's really easy to just do in your kitchen. Um, we've done it like in a jar with a little piece of cheesecloth, one of those canning jars. You just have to rinse them a couple times a day, just kind of when you're doing dishes. And before you know it, you have little sprouts and you can talk about, you know, 
why it sprouted and what that means and have something to eat. <laughs> and one thing we've done, because our family is a golf family, because my husband happens to work in the golf industry. So we have this discussion every spring and fall when the temperatures drop and frost shows up on grass. So we were talking about the impacts of frost on vegetables, especially green vegetables. So we've done experiments in the past where you stick the lettuce at like the very back of the fridge where the freezer or like where the ice tray is. So it's extra cold and you can see how it damages all the materials like the molecules in a in a plant because it becomes really mushy and so you can see how it damages so in our house that is an important lesson because otherwise my husband who is busy trying to keep grass alive when people walk on it in the <laughs> frost and the same thing with your backyard it's a good reason why not to let your kids run around on the frosty backyard because it actually can bend and damage and destroy just like it can the lettuce that you tuck and gets frozen in the back. So some interesting conversations that you can have when you're still at that season of spring where it's still a little bit cold and you get frost in the morning time. So yeah, one thing that we're trying for the first time this year is winter sowing. So it depends on where you live. I know like some places online says to do it in December. It's like, no, 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 we don't have spring in February. Um, <laughs> so where I am, we usually get our last snowstorm in May. So we, um, I was told to start about mid-March and go through to the end of April and do winter sowing. And by that, I mean, you're actually planting seeds in a special like little mini greenhouse that you're making out of a plastic container. And then you're putting them outside and they're outside until they're starting to grow and put them directly in the garden. So it's not that you're planting seedlings inside your house under lights or by a window. It's actually planting the seed in this plastic container and putting outside. So um, that's kind of a... I don't know. I don't know how it's going to turn out. The gardener that I was talking to, he's been doing it for several years. So um, I thought I'd give it a try, but kind of another way, especially if you don't have a lot of space inside and want to get a head start, like where I am, the growing season's pretty short. We can get frost in June and we usually have frost warnings in August. Yeah. Hoping to get a jump start in the season. <laughs> That's a cool idea. Plus, I, pl I bet your plants are a lot hardier since they've been kind of used to the cold weather. So that'd be kind of an interesting experiment too. Yeah, so this year I'm going to kind of experiment by planting some of the exact same seed actually directly in the garden like I would after the first frost or after the, sorry, the last frost, kind of compare. Apparently, yeah, it makes earlier crops and hardier crops. So we'll see. And there's yeah. a cool experiment kids can watch and observe too. So that's a great idea. Yeah, 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 there can be lots of neat experiments with gardening, just comparing different things or giving plants different amount of light or water or different kinds of dirt. Um, yeah, for sure. There can be lots of things, even comparing just to different types of lettuce or different types of beans or yeah. just lots of fun to try. I was thinking about how we get to watch the world come alive in the spring and how going outside and checking out nature is a great opportunity if we go for walks and we journal. I, I'm not a fantastic nature journaler. I'm not very good at art or at least I'm, I'm self-proclaimed terrible at art, but even just getting an opportunity to just observe and record down what you see in some way, whether that's photography. So if you're not great at art, one of the things my kids love to do is take pictures. So if you have an old camera or a kid, we have one of my daughter has a kid camera, so she carries it with her everywhere and takes a million pictures and then we upload it off of her, her memory card, but it gives her an opportunity to feel like a photographer. So she runs around taking all these pictures and adding all these special effects on the kid's camera, but it's a great opportunity for them to learn a little bit more about nature because they can, if you have like even a scavenger hunt approach, can you find a bud on a tree or can you find a, a spring flower like a daffodil or a crocus or a tulip or something like that? It makes it fun for them to be able to just get out and explore. For those of us who aren't quite as artistically inclined but can find pictures somehow, that can be a fun way to do it as well. I know we've done a lot of nature photography over the years. Um, we've done some nature journaling. Uh, for a few years, we had another family that we would just go and we'd pick a topic. So it was like mushrooms or spring flowers or pine cones or whatever. And we'd go observe some of that in nature. The, the other mom and I would kind of discuss it. And then the kids would sit down and draw something that caught their eye or write about it or whatever, take photos. So that was pretty cool. I think it was more motivating having like another family we did that with. I think birding is a neat one to do in the spring because especially before it's leafed out, like you can more easily see those birds that are migrating back. Um, it's just fun to kind of discover what you see in your community. Um, I know like I've joined a local birding group, so that really helps kind of learn more. Um, if you can connect with somebody who like knows a little bit more about the birds. 
I do find like in the spring, there's so many opportunities to point out all the new things you can find. Um, the snow's melting and the trees are budding and all that kind of stuff is pretty cool. I know we've often enjoyed like going to find pussy willows and then making a little bouquet of them and putting it in a vase um, without water. You just so that they don't keep opening. I thought mm. that is a cool experiment to put one in water and then watch it open a bit. So yeah, or just taking some early um, branches that are just starting to, you know, the buds are swelling and cutting off one and putting it in water and watching that open inside. Um, you get like a better opportunity to see it than if it's outside, it just happens so quick. Even like observing the same plant or tree each day outside is kind of a cool thing too. Especially like if it's in your own yard, if you have a yard, then that's really helpful or something in the neighborhood that you can keep an eye on um, and see the changes that are happening. It's pretty cool. And one of the things about spring is that there's so many opportunities for like hands-on learning by observing. So if you're able to find like milkweed, you can find the little butterfly eggs and things like that, or you can buy the pre-made pre-made pre I don't even know what the word is prepared caterpillar yeah, prepared. kits <laughs> yeah we've done both we've done the caterpillar kits um I think three times another year I actually found the same kind of caterpillar eating some sunflowers in my yard so I decided to bring a few of them in and we did it that way um last year we did um or was that last year? Maybe the year before we did a, a monarch where we found the little teeny tiny, like it was just like maybe a millimeter or two. Um, mm -hmm. Apparently in Ontario, unless, unless you get a license, which you can get, I believe it might be $30. Um, don't quote me on it. Um, you can only raise one monarch caterpillar. So we just did the one. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. It was really cool. I remember like you could actually hear it chewing. And as it got bigger and bigger, because we got it from really little, and then eventually made its chrysalis. And it was really, really cool that we were actually all home. And I just happened to look over and I saw it starting to split. And I'm like, everybody come. And we all came over and watched it open. And mm -hmm. then we got to see, um, you know, it fully open and fully dry. And then we released it in the yard. It was, it was fascinating. And all that more cool that we'd actually like found the caterpillar in our own community. Um, I don't know. It was even more special than the kits. So the kits are definitely really neat. And the first year mm -hmm. we did that, like, it was I highly recommend that activity. It was phenomenal to to see. I just never, never seen something like that. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, we did the painted lady caterpillars one year from a cat. Yeah. And it was pretty cool. And the, the thing that my kids will always remember is we did it in an aquarium because we just happened to have one at the time. So we just did it in an aquarium. But the thing that my kids will always remember is that caterpillars pop their heads off. They thought, oh. that was the, they thought that was the coolest thing when they went into their little chrysalis, they like lose their heads and that, I don't oh, know. So, that's, yeah. so many years later, they still talk about the fact that caterpillars pop their heads off. So yeah, everybody, everybody has kids, different experiences. Yeah. My kids remember the one year cause we have done it cause I have such a big age range in my family. So the one year that we, we've done it a few times so that the different kids can remember. Or I remember one year, my daughter was like, please, 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 let's do it again. I'm like, okay. So yeah, but the one year, cause we made like a butterfly house out of like tools. It's kind of the stuff they made are like bridal veils and with mm -hmm. hoops, it was just a set that I found online anyway. But then I had to clip it shut with clothespins. I guess one of the butterflies got out somehow. So my daughter, she, um, all of a sudden said to me, like, there's sounds like there's something in the furnace vent. I'm like, what? She's like, there's something in the furnace vent. And we race over and look in the furnace vent. And one of the butterflies somehow got down, you know, the, the vents in the oh. floor, like we call them the furnace yep. vent and it's down in there. So I got it out as gentle as I could and put it back. But that's like the one main thing my kids still talk about. Remember when we had the butterfly in the furnace? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it's just a lot of fun, these kinds of things. And having it right there in your house is, is really cool. Is there any other hands-on activities that you guys have done? Last year we did chicks. So that was really cool. I'd always wanted to do it. And uh, we actually got the fertilized eggs from a farm and we incubated them. And then we got to watch them hatch and learn all about that. And then we had the chicks for, I think it was about 10 days and then we returned them. That was like, yeah, I will be doing that again at some point when my son's a bit older, cause he probably ended up uh, not remembering <laughs> um, cause he was uh, four last year when we did it. So yeah. So that was something that we really, that was really enjoyable. And I think we'll stick in our memories for, well, for a lifetime. It wasn't as cheap as the caterpillars, um, but very, very like, very beneficial, very, um, I'd highly recommend it even then. 
Um, yeah, so the chicks, the caterpillars, um, we, I know we've done a lot of pond study through the years. Um, if you can learn about some of the common pond creatures that you're going to find in the spring, a lot of the uh, creatures start out in the in the water. So um, dragonflies, for example, they lay their eggs in the water and then the next year um, they come out of the water as what looks like a little insect and crawl up something. I know where we live, there's a bridge that they tend to crawl up the concrete on the bridge and they split open and out comes the dragonfly. So we have watched those um, every year when I start seeing dragonflies in the air on a really warm day, we'll go down to the lake and have a look. And we often see them crawling up and we wait and watch. And so that's been really cool doing the actual pond dipping where you're like taking a net and seeing what you can find and um, catching like frogs if you're if you're really gentle having a look at the different creatures, trying to identify them. Um, I know the caddisfly is one that's really fascinated my kids because it's like a little little larva, I guess. And it kind of collects whatever's around it in its environment to make a little protection. So you'll see, it's very hard to actually spot until you see this little thing moving because you'll see like a little bundle of sticks moving or a little bundle of rocks. <laughs> and you see that and you catch it and then it'll poke its little head out. And it's pretty neat. Later on, it'll it'll come up out of the water and um, fly away as a caddisfly. So all those things have been really fascinating for the kids to see. Um, done that quite a few times. Oh, one big one that we like to do where we are in the spring, we get the spring peepers. So um, around some point in May, I'll hear them at night. Like you crack your window open from the bedroom, like you can just hear them. And so it's really neat. Um, there's a website for Ontario and I'm, I'm sure there's ones online for other places that teach you about the different kinds of frogs and you can listen to them. And there's even some citizen science projects you can do where you actually like listen to the type of frog online and then you identify it where you live and then you mark down where it is so that they can kind of know and keep an eye on frog populations. Um, so we've done that quite a few times. It's really cool to actually like go closer to where the frogs are and listen. And if you're really still and really quiet, um, you know, because when you first get there, they'll quiet right down because they're, they sense something. And then they start up again and it's just really fascinating for the kids and can discuss all about, you know, why they're making those sounds and what happens next. And then go looking for the tadpole eggs. And um, we found like the, the strings before that are from toads. We found the clumps from the frogs. Um, and then you can later go back, you know, in a few days, a week later and kind of observe what happens next. Bring a, bring a net and a bucket and catch some and have a look okay what's happening now and kind of watching them over time and seeing the changes and the tadpoles that can be pretty cool too i think spring is a great time to do some science stuff too so i was thinking about weather spring is a great time for us to start thinking about weather because there's often a lot more precipitation than there is throughout the rest of the summer so if you can teach your kids how to make a rain gauge that can be a lot of fun plus a wind vane or even some of those things like barometers and things that check the air pressure so that you can see how the environment is working if you have anybody in your family that unfortunately suffers from, you know, allergies related to pollen, it can be a really interesting opportunity to spend some time looking at the weather uh, websites that say what the different pollens are currently high in the air. So you can see if you can connect the dots to what's causing the sneezes in your house. Also, there's lots of opportunities to study clouds too, because then you can see the different styles of clouds. I've seen some, we, in the past, we've used these really cute, cloud windows so essentially it's a paper that around the outside edges has different examples of clouds and you cut out the middle so that you can hold it up to the sky and see if you could figure out which cloud actually matches the one that you're looking at that's kind of fun as well so weather can be a great thing to to study during spring Another thing is about animal life cycles, because at this time of year, we're learning about new baby animals, but we can see, as you said, the tadpoles, for example, you can watch the development of an animal from its egg to a tadpole to the thing in Madui with legs to a frog, like those kinds of things. <laughs> sure. You're the, you're the nature person. I just, I mine's like, oh, bird. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think it's an opportunity to see more about animal life cycles as well. And I was thinking about yeah. plants too. If we're developing more about plants, then we can do things like the experiment where you see how they suck up the different colors of water. So if you put a, oh, a white yeah. carnation into like colored food coloring, you can observe how it travels through the plant to be able to see how it gets nutrition. It can be really engaging and entertaining opportunity for kids to see how plants actually 
get nutrition. So that's an idea as well. Yeah, that one's super fun. We've done that one a few times too, just through the through the years of different kids. One thing I forgot to mention during the hands-on stuff was hummingbird feeders. So mm -hmm. um, we only feed birds during the winter season because otherwise they'll become bear feeders. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, hummingbird feeders is one that we hang it up in such a way that um, apparently some people have bears that'll come even eat those the nectar out of those but um we we don't get that we hang it in a way that there's no way they could reach so anyway we have hummingbird feeders and uh we haven't had any problems with bears from those um yeah so that's a really fun way just make sure if you're doing it to follow the proper ratios and to use the normal kind of sugar apparently it's not as good to use sugar alternatives um you can really do damage to the birds and not to use red food coloring that is a big no-no it actually can really mm -hmm. harm the birds make them sick or even die so yeah, we really enjoy having those by our windows to uh, get the hummingbirds. And then another thing you can do in the spring too that my kids have always found really enjoyable is just doing art outside. So actually bringing um, your art supplies either somewhere else, like to somewhere scenic, um, maybe at a park or um, somewhere like a lake, you know, a beach, uh, somewhere where you can see something to paint in real life. Like artists actually do that. Maybe you could study an artist that has done that and have them do it. It's It's really... It's really fun. Or just even in your backyard, just do an art project that you just happen to be doing outside. So it's always been fun mm -hmm. and less messy too. You don't have to clean up the floor. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Well, I think spring is a great time to just naturally weave in some educational stuff, especially related to nature. So that's awesome to be able to consider all the opportunities that are out there, even if you're not realizing that, oh, it's spring, I should do this. It just seems to naturally weave in, right? Oh, we got to plant the garden yeah. because it's going to be summer soon. Or, oh, look at all the birds coming back. Or it's not even that we're thinking it's spring. Now we need to do this in our curriculum. It just kind of naturally weaves in. Right. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, even reading outside, that's always been a big favorite. I know it was like, I don't know, maybe it was like six degrees a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And my son's like, let's read outside and have a picnic. I'm like, mm, not quite yet. <laughs> let's put on our winter coats first and then we'll do that. <laughs> yeah, but quite often in the in the spring or in the early fall when it's still warm is something we do. We bring our lawn chairs and we'll bring our lunch outside and then all we'll all eat. And then usually kids take way longer to eat than I've done. So <laughs> then I read mm -hmm. out loud. So that's really yeah. fun. Yeah. So I know at our house, we're looking forward to being able to set up the trampoline and put out the hammocks and set up some chairs outside so we can enjoy the backyard as well. So yeah, I'm glad sure. that we've, I'm glad we've hit the point where maybe snow is close to behind us and uh, <laughs> everywhere, maybe everyone else at this point across Canada will too. I know a lot of times we've talked about how nature studies that are available for different curriculum can be frustrating and challenging for Canadians because we seem to have a different level of springtime than some of our American friends who've written yeah. curriculum. So don't be afraid that if you're choosing to use a nature study to adapt it for wherever you live. So if it says in February to go look at the tree leaves, just wait till May or whatever works best for you where you live. So don't stress too much. The idea is that it's an opportunity to get outside and just enjoy the world that you live in. So find a way to do that whenever it's available for you. Spring has always just been one of our favorite times in our homeschool. I think too, it also naturally lends itself to uh, just the fact that you're kind of done with some of the book work by then. Um, either you're you're done, actually done, or you're just done because you're tired of it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it kind of just leads to other types of learning. I mean, we we do that all the year, but it just gets to the point where you're you're ready to go outside. You're ready to um, do those kinds of activities, and it just seems like a good fit overall. I guess. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks for joining us on this episode and uh, get out there, enjoy nature and enjoy spring. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Canadian Homeschooler Podcast. We hope you've been inspired to add a little more spring to your homeschool adventures. In the next episode, we're going to talk about the realities of housekeeping and homeschooling. So we hope that you'll join us then. If you have any feedback, ideas for topics, or people that we should connect with for interviews, please let us know. And don't forget to share with your Canadian homeschooling friends. Thanks so much for joining in. Until next time, happy learning.